Welcome everyone. I would like to move slowly to our next talk. Um, it's a series of seminars organized by the University of Yetabori. And our panelists will be Maya Daniels, Elizabeth Yort, and Miklas Ostlind. Today's theme has been selected um, artwork by Lina Geushi. And the series of uh, seminars is discussing interaction between two mediums of text and image. And we will see what uh, today's selection will bring for us. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Fine. Uh, my <laughs> name is Niklas Östlin, and this is Elisabeth Jord and Maya Daniels. I would just like to say something about the, uh, the uh, format for the seminar. During the pandemic, we uh, thought we really need a way of coming together uh, in the unit of film photography and literary composition at HDK Valland to do something that kept up the kind of uh, spirit and joined us in something that we all work with in different ways and which we could explore. And I would say explore is an important part of this because this is a research oriented higher seminar. Uh, and normally it takes place uh, online uh, in a webinar uh, and uh, everyone can join. Uh, and this is uh, one of the rare occasions where we visit someone else and we're really happy to be invited and being part of Las Corona Photo uh, to practice this, which is a way also for us across the disciplines and subjects to meet and learn about the multitude of relations between text and image that are there and could be developed through these uh, activities that we do. And um, as was mentioned in Lina Gershi's uh, works are one of these, you know, kind of uh, starting points for this uh, conversation. So it's not about one artist's works, it's about the relation between text and image, just to say that. Okay. <laughs> and then I warmly <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. pass on to you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Jord, and I work, I teach in literary composition. I'm a writer, and uh, my research at the time focus on Nebru diversity and writing and that's what I do and uh, in literary composition we speak sw Swedish <laughs> so uh, I think I'm here to uh, in this group we always come with from our own subjects and try to contribute but also to learn and I think this is maybe uh, uh, opportunity. And my name is Maya Daniels. I also um, work... Can you hear me? Yeah? I hear... I see you... Yeah, better. Um, I work in the film department at uh, HTK Valland, um, Gothenburg University, but I am also a, um, a photographer myself. Um, but... I think we all have, uh, as disciplines, I mean, we, we represent three different disciplines here today, but then we are all together gathered in the, in the unit um, where, where we all teach. So that's me, and um, yeah. We also thought that we can uh, rely on that you also have been able to see the uh, Lina's works uh, and if you haven't, you will see that they will show up in the uh, images that will be uh, exhibited behind us. Uh, and I think we should start there. Uh, and they have one very uh, significant presence, and that is the uh, handwritten text on top, on the photographs. And they're often in a letter that is not, uh, it's, it's, it's in, uh, is it Persian or Arabic, the letters? It, it, it's Arabic. 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 Arabic, yeah. And I thought that is something really interesting 
because of course the calligraphic qualities gives a dimension to to the the relation between the portrait person and the text and the image but it also uh, makes us aware of how uh, the English language in a way have colonized the art, the art community so you you know you expect things to be communicated in English it's become like a lingua franca where I mean we teach and all except for you who are having uh, literary composition uh, otherwise we most of us teach in English when you expect that an artist has to be uh, speaking in English therefore I think it's really good to to be aware of that uh, through the works that you see a different kind of language really present this is just one dimension that struck me when I you know when I encountered the works there's so many other layers of course but that is one example of what happens when you see text in an image and it's not English I mean to, to connect to your reflection in in literature today, um, multilingual writing, multilingual practices are co more and more common. So we can see in the Swedish novel, there be, will be parts in Arabic or English or Swedish altogether. And I think that this kind of experience uh, is a uh, is something else and something that enriches uh, art because it's about this question that uh, everything should be visible, explainable uh, for everyone. It is an illusion <laughs> and therefore I think the, those aspects of English, Arabic uh, together in, in, with the mm. images mm. is an important part. Mm. We came quite, uh, when we started talking about this, you, you, you stumble upon this sort of question of translation immediately, not just translation in between languages, of course, but also the translation of an image uh, through text, perhaps, or what is the text supposed to do when presented together with an image, and how do we, um, how do we let ourselves be led or how do we want to allow ourselves to be led as um, the person experiencing the work um, and that also of course in in then in contrast to what the artist actually really wants to um, make sure that you as a viewer do perceive and do get in your reading and that kind of tension um, the translation and between the the maker and the receiver I, I guess, I mean, it's hard not to talk about that, isn't it? I also, um, I don't know, coming from, um, maybe from looking at it from a f more of a filmic perspective, um, there is the different types of contextualizations um, that, that are happening, but also in, in this um, instance, for example, you have a contextualizing introduction and then you have specific texts perhaps relating to different artworks and how much do you then do you choose how much you take on or where does where does all of this sit within the reader and of course when you're looking at a film you're kind of forced to keep looking until the end you can leave the room or you can exit but there is a dictating kind of element there where you're supposed to sit from the beginning to the end. Um, but a filmmaker can, of course, confuse you or ex you know, make you, you have to take so much in that it might be a bit difficult anyway. So there are, of course, different tactics of doing that. But in an exhibition space or when looking at a photograph, we, we can also choose not to get the translation. That's but true. what happens when it's there, of course, then... Yeah. I, 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 in my reading, uh, this is also the context is storytelling, uh, which is all over the world a uh, tool uh, when struggling for liberation. And uh, storytelling is something that, uh, in this particular uh, piece of work, uh, it it's something that comes from the text 
and yet the the women often are veiled with this golden strip. And so I think it's an interesting relation between all that is said in the storytelling and that which is not shown. Exactly, because the, the eyes of the portrait people, you can't see them. They are uh, in a way blinded or protected by the golden leaves. Uh, and that is, of course, gives another dimension because the texts are revealing very personal experience of harassment, sexual harassment. And by this multi bilingual Swedish, English, and, and Arabic, you, you get the stories, but there is a kind of, uh, you have to do a labor in a way as the viewer. Uh, and for us not speaking Arabic, the first confrontation with the works is they are in a way uh, withdrawing but they, they represent a, a kind of uh, something you have to uh, accept that you won't easily grasp. But I have a question for you, Elizabeth, because my, my field is photography and I'm, I'm particularly engaged in documentary practices. And then, of course, the, the question of truth and, and I mean, what images can reveal and tell about actual things. In, in literature, you also have uh, questions about fiction and facts and that it, it has a kind of productive blurred uh, border. Uh, but when you then see text in the images, what, what happens for you as a more literary oriented person? Is it's different, of course. Uh, but in, in these pieces, I, I think that it's always about uh, lies and truths, but it's al also about uh, like revealing or hiding. And we do this in text all the time. <laughs> we, we do something we know this will be only be understandable for, for someone I write to in specific. And this will, will be more understandable for other people. But when I read it, read a text in these um, pictures, I also was taken by the complexity of these w women portrayed in their homes, uh, often in a very carefully arranged home. And that's such a contrast from in the street where you are, when harassment happens, you are almost ripped of your own home. So there, I think for me it was the text was something, the vo it was a, a stronger voice uh, and it let, uh, together with the picture, it just said uh, over and over again this truth that women are both vulnerable and strong, competent and victims. Uh, and this was a really important thing that uh, I think the text mm. did. Mm. Yeah, I and agree. And we talk about this also, I think, in, in terms of how do you convey something or what, what's the storytelling perhaps in this and how do you talk about things that are, I mean, A, it's not, uh, how, yeah, how do you express, how do you talk about uh, abuse without making someone feel abused again, <laughs> or just to perpetuate this kind of violence that someone has um, been through. And I think it's exactly in this whole reveal um, and this kind of game between what you hide and what you show, uh, what you tell and what you don't tell. And um, it comes back also to, to, to filmmaking and how you work with the different types of elements that you have in front of you, if it's sound or the image or like how do you contrast these aspects in order to get someone to feel something and to engage with someone's story? And um, I, of course, I think that in this instance, there is something also about not being able to read all of the texts, that they are there almost uh, more as a, uh, as, as a kind of care in, in, as part of the encounter between the photographer and the subject, but it's not necessarily for me, at least for me personally, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I understand the context and I'm happy not to be able to 
to read the exact things that have happened, although it might be very important for the person to describe it in detail. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of way of allowing for the encounter to ha have a space also within the actual work. I think yeah. I also thought about the text as a gaze because mm -hmm. the gaze is not there. And we often talk about giving people voice or people should, in this particular w uh, uh, work, we can see that the voice are the women themselves, not someone else, I in someone else's fantasy. And then at the same time, we, we the gaze is always something that sets uh, the, the story and I felt that the the text some, somehow work as a gaze because the mm. gazes are erased. Uh. I think it's interesting that you're mentioning voice. Of course, in, in film, that is a dimension that you have which photographs not don't have in general or not written text either. But I think when you read the text, since they are handwritten, they have this indexicality. They, ha it, they kind of uh, puts you in an almost that you can hear voices. So th they kind of not personal only in that everyone has an individual handwriting, but also that they reveal a kind of voice. But that is an aspect, of course, much more present in film mm. that you can explore and using the voice as something to anchor it in a factual, personal experience. Mm. But sometimes that's also the joy of photography, that you don't have all of those things, and that you're then, as a viewer, you have to be activated and to fill in those gaps, and to be able to then come in with <laughs> an imaginary voice for this person. And so you become invested in a way that you don't necessarily have to be when you're passively watching someone speak. Um, so that's also one of the joys, I think, in, in, in stripping down and stripping these aspects away. That photography, I mean, photography is that, that medium. We had this little quarrel when we came here, a small, small war between our subjects. <laughs> <laughs> if the texts are dominant, always dominant in, mm. in uh, art or in relation to other and you as a text person, you said, <laughs> say, no, no. <laughs> that's not. <laughs> but it's often instrumental in a way uh, when text and build are supposed to work together. The text gets instrumental, but not always. But I think that, that um, the text has a dominant type. But I mean, the film medium, mm. I, I think it's really dominant uh, mm. and um, there are so many things to, to do with texts that can change that impression, I think. Yeah, I mean, film is definitely the most manipulative medium, I would say. There's, of course, because of all of the different layers and what the different layers will do when they come together. Um, but there is also something about the subtitles and yeah. the text uh, like the text blocks within a film, how they will lead you mm. through the understanding of what you're seeing always and lead you in the, even in the understanding of what you're hearing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I maybe I come to photography or I think of photography as a, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm of that perhaps school myself where I want to, uh, try to think of the image as its own text. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there will always be some sort of jarred encounter between the two. Um, but also looking at, com looking at photography, I guess, as that medium that is not, s or shouldn't speak on beha or, or in the same way as text does. It should speak in a different way. But Elizabeth, I think there is, there is another way of, of uh, approaching it. I think the, the, there is a long debate, not at least in photography, but also in visual art in general, that uh, the image should stand for itself. It should not be dependent on anything. And I think that a lot 
uh, relates to actually theory and interpretation, and social talks are, you know, the the against interpretation, <coughs> so mm. that the text and and that uh, discourse of knowledge that uh, is seen as the uh, most accurate way of approaching the 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 content and what images can do. Uh, but this is an example of would I say that where the text is actually both text and image in itself. Mm -hmm. So the texts are also visual. Mm. And it also it becomes integrated as a visual element in the, in the work. So it is a bit different. But otherwise, I do agree, text has a tendency to colonize visuality. That visual, and of course, visuality is difficult to <laughs> discuss without words and theories. Mm. But there, we often feel that there is more to it than can be explained so mm. so that just mm. a, a kind of side comment to the relation mm. and the colonization of text yeah. versus images but i think also that these combinations or these multilingual practices might be a way of question uh, these manipulations or you can just there opens space space spaces are open for another interpretation, maybe in the combination of text, film, languages, and yeah. Uh, yeah. But then, of course, it's the question of sequencing mm. when you have multiple images <coughs> and you put them together. And in this instance as well, when you have multiple testimonies and you put them together, because then, of course, they also do something else together uh, as they, you know, in comparison to what they do when they're alone. And I guess in this instance, it's about the repetition, right? That this happens again and again. And it's not just one instance. It's not just one, um, uh, what's it called? It's not just one nationality. It happens to people who speak in or write in different languages. So it becomes a bigger question through the sequence, um, through the repetition. And so, of course, then that will then y you have a contextualizing aspect and you have the individual aspect. Um, yeah. I have a question that relates more to our different uh, subjects and genres. And the, um, this, is a, this is a documentary work, in a way. It, and it, it deals with actual experiences of traumatic nature. I must say that the organizer have put it in a very, you know, it's contextualized beautifully in the entrance of Ruad Hibsat, where a lot of people get married. <laughs> and <laughs> violence, <laughs> there is, of course, the, yeah. there are harassments in the street, but there's also harassments in the domestic uh, area. So it, it has this kind of, OK, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a place where these things really, maybe you don't want to think about it at that moment, but they are a political, a social, and factual reality. But when, when it is photography, and you do a work like this, if you spend some time there and looking how people glancing, uh, it, they spend like two, three minutes in the space, and then they leave, they leave, they get a, a general view, what, this work is about and leave it. If it's a documentary film or if it's a, a, a book, then you, I think you spend more time with it. And that comes in a way with a different medium's uh, way of uh, presenting themselves in the public. Mm. So you have to be drawn in or you have a moment, a very s sharp moments when you have the capacity with photography to show someone something mm. um, and then glance and continue on with their day. True. You're saying that if you're dealing with a subject like this or other you know, documentary issues, in the film you, you kind of contain or you're, you, you keep the audience in a different way. And that photography actually has, I would say, a disadvantage in, 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 in that respect. 
Hmm. Maybe, should we say that it's, that questions are welcome, or if, if you think <laughs> that we are just saying very strange things? Yeah, you're welcome <laughs> for us. <laughs> you're welcome to, to. I mean, it, but it is, I guess that it, it boils down to the question of what medium do you choose, mm. and at what time, and wh what do you want to say, and how do you want to say it? So always it feels strange to just kind of compare the mediums and say, well, this medium does this and this does mm. that. Of course, we are trained somehow in different um, disciplines to a certain degree, but we, ha we have the right as well to, to decide what works best for our purposes. Um, I guess that's also what we are trying to do in our unit. We're trying to make you know, interdisciplinary connections between subject matter or you know, ways of doing instead of just learning one craft and only knowing how to do that. Yeah. Because it, yes, it, it, exactly as you're saying, it, it all depends on you know, how this subject matter will be portrayed or, or conveyed to an audience and how you know how you as a maker want to do that yes like to react yes oh. hi so i think regarding photography being a limited medium i definitely agree with you but um on the other hand as maya was saying earlier it does give the viewer the freedom to choose how much they want to take in and absorb. And also film nowadays, especially after the pandemic and everyone being locked in, you, you watch films and how many times do you pause to go to the bathroom or to grab mm -hmm. a snack or to decide to continue the film on a different day? Mm -hmm. so, so I think we can't just say like, this is better than that. It really depends on the subject matter. And surprisingly, I've been seeing people going into um, the, the venue and spending like five to 10 minutes because it really depends on the subject matter. And like if it's commercial or fashion or like very um, aesthetically pleasing images without description, maybe you will spend three minutes, but this is not a subject matter that you spend three minutes on. It's either you choose to delve in or you're gonna like go out straight away. So, yeah. <laughs> Was it always a given for you to do it this way? Like the way that you now present the work? How did that come about? Um, I think it came from a place of not wanting to speak on behalf of others and we're talking a lot about voice and agency, and these are extremely important factors for me to, to feel like the work is participatory and that it's a collective um, work rather than just me dictating um, what's being said or communicated. That's why it's very open in terms of what language the women are describing their testimonies in. So yeah, and... Um, it was really up to their own um, um, feeling and, and how they felt comfortable that they decided to be anonymous. And because in Egypt, the, the, the color gold is very common from, from ancient Egypt. So that's why I'm using a golden brush stroke. And it's not really to hide, but it's to protect their identities. Mm. Thank you. Just to pick up on that, the, the, I think the, one of the beautiful things of being a unit where I have film photography and literary composition is that y you, you kind of develop something that has actually almost always been there, this transgression between the different form, art forms or way of mediating and communicating. So, so what you always see is, and that I would like to say then is, is something that is an advantage for photography you can present simultaneously in different contexts and formats. So at the same time, you have an exhibition like this, it can also be a book format, and it could also be uh, arranged as a film. So that, that is, in a way, and even more so with digital production means, it's, it becomes a seamless uh, mowing between still image, 
exhibitions, books, etc. So that is, I think, that would be more and more the uh, mm -hmm. modus operandi of, of film mm -hmm. photography and literature in this mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was also thinking about when you said you, you stopped the film to go to the bathroom or <laughs> whatever, <laughs> uh, but we also work with references uh, and we sometimes mix texts and images and something that is uh, for I'm thinking of the poet Claudia Rankin who uh, in her poetry she uses sometimes uh, sequences of pictures of film sequences and they might be a reference for the reader to continue to explore or uh, maybe move <laughs> and the physical aspect of this uh, to change between different readings of different mm. expressions. Uh, I think it's mm. one mm. aspect. Yeah, and I think that um, I think, I mean, for me, um, I've always uh, worked with photography that I teach in film, um, but I've studied sociology. So it's, it's, it's always interdisciplinary in a way. Like I could equally engage with a film as I can with, with any other types, but, but, it, but, but it is interesting how I think um, when, uh, I think we had a unit meeting when we were discussing different ways of kind of deciphering work or the way that we, in our, different disciplines work through that and I think we all thought we were very unique perhaps in, in how we did it but it's all also about um, I, I had that interesting kind of we had that interesting conversation that it's about learning to read images or to read not just just to write or to make pictures but also how do you uh, how do you understand them and how do we understand them together and and I think it's a shame now that we sit in our own kind of bedroom and look at the films, or like during that pandemic that we um, don't spend time looking at things together because things happen in that shared moment as well. Um, things happen when we discuss works together and like even just in a conversation like this, you know, we, we become richer through the conversation that takes place also in understanding what are these aspects doing to our understanding or to our reading or to how we view the work. Um, so I guess, um, I guess it's also a context of, of in the sharing of the works and in the res reception. Um, so it's, I don't know what I'm trying to get to. I think it's just good to be able to have these conversations cross disciplines as well. I have one comment also on the fact that the texts are literally inscribed in the visual image. And most of the examples we have are of that kind. The text is inseparable from, from mm -hmm. the work. Uh, what happens historically, if you're a documentary photographer and you want to make a work where not you speak on behalf of others, but as you did uh, l make people speak through the work, is that when they later are displayed, particularly in art museums, you find the images separated from the text. So the audience meet the images and often very iconic uh, works from a longer series. And they become like candy in a way where the, the context and the content is erased. And then, of course, you can go to the books because they're often, almost always, uh, produced as books as well. Uh, but in an art museum context, they can't display the books on the wall and they focused on vintage prints. So then the work is not meeting the audience as it should in a way. Mm -hmm. And that won't happen with a film or with a book because you can't extract the two parts in a way. That's true. So they have mm. to defend themselves, or you inscribe the text in the work. <laughs> <laughs> we also saw a very fascinating other example of um, 
of the text or a way of doing that. Uh, I'm going to try and find the name because I'm so bad. But in the in the museum, uh, Haley Morris Cafiero, mm -hmm. who is um, also playing around with the way that the text can immediately be part of of the reading of an image and how it can then also somehow contextualize within the actual image um, so as not to have the text over there and then to lose um, and it was it was a play very playful way of, of yeah. doing it and also playing with you know taking different roles and she kind of goes into the role of someone who's abused her in some ways um, but in a very uh, it, it felt like a very playful way of of doing it, so we found many different examples mm. as we made our way through. Yeah. Anyone else having any comments or questions? Otherwise, it seems like we are supposed to. We have round up. about five minutes, but okay. no pressure. Perhaps Lina also would like to add something if she feels like. <laughs> Do you, I, I'm assuming that there are many photographers in the room. Do you feel like the image, uh, sorry, the text is somehow subordinate to the image? Well, no, not subordinate, the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have a microphone there? Um, I am. Um I'm both uh, write poetry and take pictures, and for me, it's the how I um, um, uh, how approach? I approach how I approach uh, the things I want to describe is for me the same when I take a picture as I write a poem, because a poem. It's very uh, minimalistic, and or can be, and it's a lot about things that is not written. It's behind the lines, or and for me, it's the same when I take a picture. Um, so in that way, I think it's a bit similar. Uh, um, it depends on the kind of text you're working with. Mm. So, so for me, poems are like pictures, you know. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Uh, it's not necessary. Uh, on text is more like on the same level as an image or a photography because it's uh, directed to other parts of it's not a brain <laughs> or uh, it might not be a long story, it's something mm -hmm. sudden. I think that's very relevant, but poetry and photography, I think, have much things in common. Mm. It's also interesting to play with the, just with what you give away and what, what you hold back. And um, for me, photography is, uh, is the best way of resisting, in a way, of holding back mm. and of allowing for someone to enter into um, Entering into that space with you, um, with with yeah, with minimal kind of guidance in a way, and I think you have to, uh, with photography, you have to find your own way in. It's also difficult then. Sometimes it's very easy to just dismiss it or to not get sucked in. But if you do, then you've actually succeeded with something. And f I mean, personally, I I have tried to convey things about language. A specific language through just images, and then there's ov obviously it, it's all about the the not hearing the actual language or the not revealing the actual mystery that then becomes what you can play around with. So for me, it's um, even if it is subordinate, that's the whole key, or that's the joy and the magic of photography. Um, it's the underdog, but it can also be, that could be a good thing, in a way, when it comes to inf being informative or giving something away. But if you say it's the same, then, then we don't even have a war anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
that's good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Are we allowed to say something about the upcoming event? Because image and text will continue, so our next seminar, which you can find if you go to HDK webpage and you can see information more there. It will be a conversation between Annika Elisabeth von Hauswolf and Mara Lee. And both of them are visual and writing artists and uh, they would speak about Annika's works. Uh, but with that conversation you will meet both of these artists who are actually I mean, they, it, it will be incredibly interesting. Do you know the date? I don't remember the date, uh, yeah. But you find it online. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for incredibly captivating conversation that surely open uh, horizons in many directions. And now uh, we have a break for a few minutes, and then I will see you again over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.